we'll get started. We're doing a retinal vascular disease part two. So this is excluding diabetic retinopathy. Last week, for um, those of you that weren't here, we did venous and arterial occlusions. Um, and I think uh, Nico got the PowerPoints if you need them. It kind of goes over all the studies that um, you would need to know. So this week, it's really kind of a hodgepodge of um, vascular disease in the retina that we are supposed to cover. It's really all coming out of, I think, mostly chapter six in your book. Um, so ocular ischemic syndrome, hypertensive retinopathy, sickle cell coats, macroaneurysms, juxtafo juxtafovial telangiectasia, radiation retinopathy, valsalva, terse and perches. So it's like this big bag of stuff, and we'll try and get through it all um, and kind of get the salient points in for you guys. Um, this morning. So first we'll cover ocular ischemic syndrome and is this, sorry, is it kind of, is it going on its own? Let me see. What's that? It's kind of just going on its own. I, do you know how to? Can try presenter view. That's what I was doing, oh. and it was just kind of. Is there a way to, I feel like it's... Or you can play from start as well. Unless you have notes. Yeah, I have some notes, but they'll come up, so... Oh, okay. Okay. Well, hopefully it doesn't... Yeah. Hopefully. Zoom along. Okay. Okay. It's zooming along. How do I... Do you know? Oh, is it moving by itself? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. Huh. We'll see if it wants to move by itself. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, sorry. Technical issues. So ocular ischemic syndrome is characterized by reduced blood flow to the eye, and this leads to ischemia both the anterior and posterior segments, and it's caused by severe carotid occlusion. Typically, patients are complaining of vision loss that's very slow over weeks to months, and they'll often complain of pain. The pain often gets better when they're laying down just because then they get Im improved perfusion to the eye when they lay down. You'll typically see it in older men. The ratio of men to women is about two to one, and it can be bilateral, but it's not very common. It's pretty rare, but it's thought that these numbers are an underestimate, underestimate and um, it can often be confused with a vein occlusion or diabetic retinopathy. So those are the two things to really keep in mind and to, to rule out, and we'll go over those. So um, the findings you'll see on the anterior segment, uh, the classic thing is uh, neovascularization of the iris, cell and flare of the uh, anterior chamber. You can get corneal edema, and often you'll see a, an asymmetric cataract. Um, the iris findings, they'll have synechia with the fixed pupil and iris atrophy, and they'll often have elevation of the intraocular pressure. They can develop neovascular glaucoma. And then on the uh, posterior segment findings, the really classic thing are these mid-peripheral dot blot hemorrhages. Uh, you might see optic nerve pallor or optic nerve edema. They can also have macular edema or vitreous hemorrhages, neovascularization of the posterior segment as well. Um, so uh, typically you'll find greater than 90% stenosis of that ipsilateral carotid artery, and this can often be the initial manifestation of carotid occlusive disease. These are going to be your typical kind of vascular paths at the VA, ischemic heart disease, they've had CVAs, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and they, it's an important diagnosis to make because they do have a higher mortality rate and a high rate of of stroke, so you want to make sure you're not missing this and calling it diabetes or vein occlusion when it's really this, because it can, you know, it's impact their, their life. So this is really our typical um, fundus findings, these mid-peripheral blot hemorrhages, and I think um, 
really of note is looking at the vasculature here, and you can see that the vessels you know, are pretty straight, they're not dilated, they're not tortuous, and that'll help you distinguish that from a vein occlusion. You also don't see a lot of beading like you would see with a, a diabetic. Uh, one way to help make the diagnosis is with ophthalmodynamometry. And so what you're doing here is you're trying to estimate the pressure in the ophthalmic artery at the site of the central retinal artery. And so what you'll do is just gently apply pressure to the globe and you'll start to see the arterial pulsations. You shouldn't really be able to cause that winking just with your finger, you know, when you're doing an indirect exam. And if you can start seeing those pulsations, you know that they have this reduced perfusion pressure and they're more likely to have ocular ischemic syndrome. So I'll often do that just when I'm doing uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy ophthalmoscopy, just press on the globe and you'll start to see this blinking of the vessels and, um, and that can help you differentiate this from a central vein occlusion as well. Uh, so imaging findings, the most uh, specific sign is delayed choroidal filling. Uh, most commonly you're going to see prolongation of the AV transit time in 95% of patients. You'll also, also see vascular staining and um, a small percentage of patients will have macular edema with angiographic leakage. So the choroid, you, you should know this, but it'll fill within five seconds of the initial dye appearance in the, in the choroidal vessels. But in ocular ischemic syndrome, it can take up to a minute or longer for the, for the choroid to fill. So this just shows this um, vascular staining that you can see, sorry, in the in the peripheral vessels there, and then the mid-peripheral kind of dot blot hemorrhages. And there's not a lot of pathology in the posterior pole, you'll notice. Uh, so to help make the diagnosis, really the first test we're gonna get is the carotid Doppler. That's the least ex expensive, the least invasive, and the less risk, and you can often make the diagnosis with that. If that's equivocal, then you'll move to an MR angiogram or a CT angiogram. The last test we'll order, if, you're, if those don't give you the diagnosis, would be a carotid angiogram. That's really the gold standard to make the diagnosis. Um, however, it's not really ideal because it's costly and there's a high risk of complications, including stroke, cerebral infarct, and a mortality, you know, about a 1% mortality rate. So, um, so we don't do that commonly, but, but if you can't get the diagnosis any other way, then that's what you would move to. So this table came from a uh, review article uh, in Survey of Ophthalmology from 2010, and I think this is a really, it's a busy table, but it really kind of helps highlight the findings and the difference between ocular ischemic syndrome, a vein occlusion, and diabetic retinopathy. I know it's busy. <laughs> so, um, but I think, you know, just kind of looking through it, you know, looking at the vasculature, so in ocular ischemic syndrome, they're not really torturous. They might be dilated, but they're not torturous. Vein occlusion, they're gonna be dilated and torturous. And in diabetes, they're dilated and they're beating. So that'll help you. The location of the hemorrhages, so um, like I said, ocular ischemic syndrome, they have these mid-peripheral kind of blot hemorrhages. They really don't have a lot of flame hemorrhages like you would see with a vein occlusion. Diabetes, the location of the hemorrhages, they're involving the posterior pole and the mid-periphery where in ocular ischemic syndrome, they're just, they're really not in the posterior pole. Um, other changes with the vein occlusion, you might see shunt vessels at the optic nerve. You won't see that with ocular ischemic syndrome. Um, exudates are not really present in ocular ischemic syndrome, but they are very common in diabetes and rarely in a vein occlusion. And then the optic nerve can be normal. It might be pellerodematous, but it's most awfully, often normal in ocular ischemic syndrome. Vein occlusion, you'll have an edematous nerve, and diabetic retinopathy can be edematous if you have like a diabetic papillopathy picture, but that's not common. And then we talked about um, the perfusion pressure, and that's decreased, and that's one of the distinguishing characteristics um, that you can do in your exam chair to help you kind of make that diagnosis. But if you're if you have a doubt, you know, it doesn't hurt you. If you have like a mild non-ischemic vein occlusion and you're not sure, you can get a carotid Doppler to kind of rule this out. And then imaging changes, um, you know, the, the choroidal filling being patchy and delayed is a common in ocular ischemic syndrome. And then in um, vessel staining for ocular ischemic syndrome, you typically see arterial staining more than veins, whereas in a vein occlusion, you see venous staining more than arteries. Diabetic retinopathy, neither of them will stain. So um, I know that's a lot, but it is helpful, I think, to, to kind of differentiate those three diagnoses.
Uh, so the prognosis is pretty poor, actually. Um, if they have neovascularization of the iris, 90% uh, are legally blind within one year. Uh, PRP is pretty effective in uh, treating neovascularization, but they do have a high mortality rate with a 40% mortality rate at five years due to ischemic cardiovascular disease. So treatment, um, working with the vascular surgeon for carotid artery stenting or, I don't know why it's skipping ahead, sorry, and, and, our, and our directomy. I've had patients that have been sent directly from radiology straight to the vascular surgeon because they've had such severe stenosis. Um, and then for treating the ocular disease, uh, anti-VEGF agents are useful for neovascularization of the iris or neovascular glaucoma, panretinal photocoagulation, and then working with your glaucoma specialist if they need glaucoma surgery, such as a tube or a shunt, um, depending on how severe glaucoma could be. Do you guys have questions about ocular ischemic syndrome? Okay. So we'll move on to hypertensive retinopathy. So um, really, you know, the majority of patients that have mild to moderate hypertension, they really don't have fundus findings or ocular complaints but you'll see in really severe hypertension or acute malignant hypertension, you can see severe um, uh, vision loss and ophthalmic signs. So uh, this is classified by the modified Shea classification. Grade zero is a normal fundus exam. Grade, grade one, arterial narrowing. Grade two, you'll see narrowing with focal irregularities in grade three is grade two plus retinal hemorrhages or exudates, and then grade four, you'll, you'll also see optic nerve swelling. Um, you know, the effects of high blood pressure can be seen at any layer, at the retina, the cord, the optic nerve, and you know, if you see AV nicking, it doesn't really predict what their blood pressure could be. That, you know, if you check it in the clinic, it might be normal, but they could have kind of chronic high blood pressure problems. Um, there's not a great correlation. So what grade is this? Anybody? Three. Three, yeah. So you see they have severe hypertensive retinopathy. They have a macular star, cotton wool spot, hemorrhages, but there's no optic nerve edema, as opposed to this would be four with severe optic nerve edema, hemorrhages. Um, the changes in the choroid are often seen, seen in younger patients that have, have acute hypertension. So these are the eclamptic um, Women, uh, people with pheochromocytoma or, uh, or renal hypertension. So you'll see this kind of tan lobule patch of the choriocapillaris um, from ischemia, and then this turns into this pigmented spot that you can see here, and this is called an Elschnick spot. Uh, the other kind of characteristic finding is uh, called a Segrist streak. And this is this linear, linear pigmentation that follows the choroidal artery seen in acute hypertension. I don't see that commonly. I think the thing I see more often, my um, eclamptic women often come in with this exudative detachments that are involving the macula, kind of a central serocyte uh, picture. And you follow those, they manage their blood pressure, they have their baby, the eclampsia goes away and it often resolves on their own. So the most important thing checking the blood pressure in the clinic. If it's very high, I've sent them to the emergency room. If it's moderately high, you'll kind of work with their primary care doctor, kind of depending on the urgency of the situation, but the treatments to get the blood pressure controlled, obviously. So moving on to sickle cell disease, which is rarely seen here, but will be on the OCAPs regardless. Um, you know, sickle cell, you know, this has been on your, uh, boards type tests you've been doing for years, but it's a valine substitution for glutamate um, results in an adenine instead of thymine, and then you get this reduced solubility um, with the sickling of the red blood cells in the, uh, in the vessels. Hemoglobin C is a lysine substitution for glutamate. So sickle cell trade is seen in 8% of African Americans sickle cell, 0.4% disease, and then hemoglobin SC disease is in 0.2% of African Americans. Um, I think this is more commonly on your OCAPs, which is which one has the highest rate of systemic complications versus ocular complications. So uh, systemic complications, the highest rate is in sickle cell disease, um, and they rarely get proliferative uh, sickle retinopathy. 
uh, the higher rates of ocular disease are going to be in the SC and the S S thal acemia trait disease. So what's happening is you get sickling of these blood cells that leads to uh, hemostasis and thrombosis, and then you get peripheral uh, occlusion and non-perfusion, and then in response, you'll get retinal neovascularization at the border of this perfused and non-perfused retina. Uh, kind of our common non-proliferative findings are the salmon patch hemorrhage, and so this is intraretinal hemorrhage uh, downstream of a retinal arterial occlusion. Uh, initially, it'll be bright red, and then as those RBCs are hemolyzed, it becomes this kind of pinkish salmon color. Um, and then as it becomes further broken down, you'll get these refractile deposits, and that's absorbed heme underneath the ILM. And then further downstream from that, you'll develop this black sunburst lesion, which is basically uh, pigmentation moving into that area of hemorrhage under the RPE. Yeah. The salmon patch hemorrhage is intraretinal, yeah. Why is it different? Like, why is it a pink hemorrhage versus, you know, any other um, It's more long standing, so the blood is starting to get uh, hemolyzed. So initially it's bright red, and then as the blood cells get broken down, it becomes pink, and then it becomes uh, pigmented. <coughs> the salmon patch, I know. I <laughs> Um, the other thing that's common in sickle cell disease as well as sickle trait are these are angioid streaks, and this occurs in about 6% of these patients. And this is thought that there's occlusions in the choroidal circulation that are happening, and then uh, subsequently develop breaks in Brooks membrane. And often you'll get choroidal nevascular membranes that can occur in association with angioid streaks. Um, you probably, how commonly do you see sick? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here, uh, you know, maybe like a couple patients are kind of around with it, but it's pretty uncommon here. But you're probably dealing with it all constantly. Um, so, stages of uh, proliferative retinopathy. Uh, the first thing you'll find is peripheral occlusions that lead to non perfusion. And then you'll develop these hairpin loops or AV anastomoses. And these are occurring peripherally in the areas where you see that distinction from the perfused to the non-perfused retina. And then after that, you'll get these peripheral C-fans, um, which are neovascular blood vessels. And then those can hemorrhage and then often lead to tractional detachments. Uh, the location of the neovascularization um, in distinction to diabetes, these uh, C-fans are occurring in the peripheral retina, whereas when we look at diabetic retinopathy, they're often along the posterior pole, along the arcades and the, and the optic nerve. Frequently, these uh, C-fans can auto-infarct, and you'll see these kind of white C-fan picture. So this is a, an active C-fan, an attractional detachment, and then this is auto-infarcted here. And then this is a wide-field imaging showing these uh, peripheral C-fans, and you can see the edge of the perfused to the non-perfused retina, and that's where these C-fans are developing, as opposed to the fluorescein you'd see in diabetes. You would see those, the neovascularization occurring along these arcades, the optic nerve, and nasally, typically. And this just, uh, just shows you this is a diabetic so you can see the, the location of the neovascularization is completely different than what you see with uh, sickle cell disease. Other findings are these comma-shaped uh, vessels in the inferior fornix and the bulbar conjunctiva from sickling. So I think considerations for patients that are African American that present with hyphema should consider screaming, screening for sickle cell disease. Uh, they can have more um, difficulty getting their pressure control. They're frequently rebleed, and an earlier AC washout is recommended. Uh, you don't want to use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because this can worsen the sickling. Um, for patients with sickle cell disease, they should get uh, twice yearly dilated uh, examinations to monitor for proliferative disease, uh, and you want to consider doing a baseline fluorescein angiogram too to, to document and to evaluate for 
peripheral non-perfusion. There are some emerging <coughs> potential therapies to prevent proliferative disease, and the idea is to kind of stimulate this fetal hemoglobin with hydroxycarbamide treatment of children, or perhaps reducing the sickle cell cells via exchange transfusion or hyperbaric oxygen. Um, as far as laser treatment, some advocate for a feeder vessel closure of the C-fans, and others do kind of peripheral scatter laser to the areas of non-perfusion to cause regression. Uh, either way, you want to be cautious and judicious in uh, when you do laser and how intense the laser is because laser has been known to precipitate retinal tears and retinal detachments uh, more commonly than it would in, in diabetic patients. And then um, there might be some role for anti-VEGF agents as well. Do you use anti-VEGF agents in these patients or? Laser, yeah. Um, so perioperatively, um, when they develop detachments, uh, tractional detachments or combined tractional regimatogenous detachments when you're planning surgery, you want to avoid encircling elements. The idea is to um, that those encircling elements can lead to anterior segment ischemia. So, um, you know, you can do segmental buckle, segmental elements, but, but you want to avoid those 360 elements. Um, you want to be careful with your cryopexy because uh, you don't want to promote that anterior segment ischemia and, and you don't want to use epinephrine in your, in your anesthetics. Uh, and then for the systemic uh, control, you want to make sure they're adequately hydrated, nasal oxygen, and then be careful with your gas use. Um, and then you want to really be careful with their intraocular pressure postoperatively to, so that they don't develop vascular occlusions or anterior segment ischemia. So the, the detachment often begins in this ischemic retina that's in the periphery and it can be brought on by laser and the tears will be just at the base of a C fan. Uh, they have a pretty high rate of complications and some, um, some authors report recurrent detachments as high as 40 to 50% in uh, proliferative sickle cell disease. So, um, you know, when you're uh, evaluating a patient with peripheral neovascularization, there's a pretty broad differential. This is coming from table 6-2 in your book. Um, so uh, you want to keep in mind uh, diabetes, vein occlusions, arterial occlusions, sickle cell, CC fistulas, uh, Irvan. Do you guys know what Irvan is? Anybody? Brian? No? idiopathic retinal vasculitis, aneurysms, and neuroretinitis. So it's pretty uncommon, um, but it would be on your differential. I don't know, maybe that, it kind of falls more into your uveitis lecture, so I didn't talk about it today. Um, you know, ROP fever, hyperviscosity syndrome, Mule's disease, ocular ischemic syndrome, and then inflammatory diseases uh, can also lead to neovascularization. Commonly, you'll see that with pars planitis chronic detachments and melanomas can also lead to, to neovascularization. So, um, moving on to Coates disease. This is characterized by these retinal telangiectasia, and then you get these ectetic arterioles, microaneurysms, <coughs> venous dilation, and then you get massive exudation, and uh, you can get these massive exudative detachments. They can be peripheral or in the macula. There's a pretty wide presentation clinically. Um, you know, we, you're always taught that it's unilateral, but there's more and more evidence that this could be a bilateral disease just based on wide field imaging. Um, but on your test, it's unilateral and typically male. There's a worse prognosis when these, when these present at a younger age. Um, Coates disease obviously is in your differential for leukocoria. I couldn't remember, do you guys have a mnemonic? Is there some mnemonic for leukocoria or you just have to know it? Just know it, okay. <laughs> you just have to know it. <laughs> okay, so for leukocoria, Coates disease, um, ROP, retinoblastoma is really the big one, fever, uh, toxocara, pars planitis, eels, persistent fetal vasculature, metastatic disease, Norris disease. Um, so um, if you find calcium on your ultrasound or your CT scan, calcium is Coates? No. <laughs> retinoblastoma. So if you see calcium, that's retinoblastoma, not Coates disease. Uh, 
Um, there are these staging systems for Coates disease, and there's these two different staging systems. I've never seen anybody test on this, um, you know, stage one through five, and they're both pretty similar, just that they begin with sort of mild vascular changes that progress to partial detachments, total detachments, and then complications include neovascular glaucoma, and these eyes, when very severe, can progress to this kind of blind, painful eye and can require enucleations ultimately. Um, in very severe cases. Usually la laser and cryo are pretty successful in controlling the exudative disease. Um, uh, rarely you might have to progress to doing surgery, including buckles or vitrectomies. And then like I said, the worst case would be going to an enucleation for a, for a painful blind eye. Um, often the patients that present uh, Younger have a worse prognosis and have more severe disease, and those are the ones that are more likely to, to progress to these really large retinal detachments. When they're older, it's usually milder, and it can often regress on its own even. So macular tel telangiectasia, it's also called parafoveal telangiectasia or juxtafoveal telangiectasia. It's characterized by focal retinal gliosis and telangiectasias. Uh, there's really three types, type one is fairly uncommon, but that's one is for unilateral, often seen in males. And then type two is the most common type. And so if you hear someone say MACTEL, they're probably just talking about type two um, is sort of the uh, nomenclature. And then type three is incredibly rare. I, I don't even know if I've ever seen a case of it, to be honest, but it's bilateral with uh, retinal capillary obliteration. On histology, um, the structural abnormalities in macular telangiectasia is actually similar to diabetes, and they're getting deposits of excess basement membrane in the retinal capillaries. So this is a, a case of macular telangiectasia type 1. This is thought to be a variant of Coates disease in older men. It's also known as Leber's miliary aneurysms, and they have these one to two disc diameters of exudates and telangiectasias in the, in the temporal macula with this kind of ring of exudates. And the macular edema is kind of waxes and wanes without treatment on its own. And so often these patients will retain excellent vision despite this type of picture. Here's another example of type 1A and then an angiogram with this temporal leakage and these kind of focal telangiectetic vessels that leak late. Type 1B is also unilateral, middle-aged men. Uh, they can complain usually of some mild metamorphopsias, um, and then they'll have this kind of focal telangiectetic vessel just right in the um, foveal avascular zone. They often have vision better than 2025, and just based on the location of this, it's not recommended to really do any treatments or any laser because they retain good vision anyways. It has a pretty good prognosis. And then type 2 MACTEL, which we see a lot of here, and this is, you know, Dr. Bernstein's big thing is studying macular tell, MACTEL, studying the, the, the carotenoids and the pigmentation, and he's involved in a big international consortium to, to better understand MACTEL. Um, it's characterized by these right angle venules that then become um, pigmented, you can often see crystal and retinopathy or these kind of glistening white dots, which are called Singerman spots. They can later develop choroidal neovascular membrane. It's typically bilateral but asymmetric, and it, your patients that present with this are usually kind of in their mid-50s when they, when they come in. These are the stages of MACTEL type 2. So, uh, first stage, they'll have a totally normal exam, but you might see a little bit of staining on your fluorescein angiogram. And then in stage two, you'll start to get this kind of grayish sheen to the fovea and mild vessels in that temporal region. And then stage three, you'll get those vessels that start to dive in at this right angle into the perifoveal re retina. And then in stage four, you'll start to get these pigmented plaques develop around those vessels. And then stage five is a choroidal neovascular membrane. Um, patients typically are symptomatic in stages three through five. Most patients have pretty good vision, 2030 to 2040, uh, but they do complain of, of visual distortions, or, but, but they do retain pretty good vision. And then you can see crystalline deposits at, um, pretty much stage two through stage five, they'll get this crystalline retinopathy, so that would be on your differential for crystal deposits in the retina. Um, 
Uh, this just shows the loss of the luteal pigment. And this um, is a case report that has some really nice imaging that shows what the images look like uh, in, in uh, MacTel. You get this crystalline retinopathy that develops. Uh, this is the fundus autofluorescence with loss of that uh, normal um, hypo autofluorescence in the center. And then on the angiogram in the early phases, you'll get these temporal telangiectetic vessels and then those leak late in the angiogram. And this is really a pretty typical OCT. You can see these inner and outer cystoid spaces in the retina, loss of the outer nuclear layers here, and then this inner kind of lamellar defect is often in this parallel axis to the, uh, to the retina, and then this would be called like this ILM drape that you can see kind of covering that cystoid space. And this is more advanced disease, stage four, and then stage five with the development of a net. Type three, like I said, is very rare. I don't think I've ever seen a case, but um, it can occur in men and women. It's idiopathic, and it's, uh, they have pretty severe vision loss with capillary occlusion, and later they develop telangiectetic vessels. For treatment options, type one, you can consider uh, laser photocoagulation, just kind of a focal laser to the areas of, of leaky vessels. Type two, it's really not any great treatment. People have tried laser, people have tried anti-VEGFs, um, you know, just for those cystic changes. People have tried steroids, PDT, nothing really works well. But if they do develop a CNBM, then you wanna uh, treat them with anti-VEGF agents. And like I said, they usually retain pretty good vision regardless of, of what you do. Unless they develop a CNBM, then they can lose vision. Any questions on MacTel? Sorry, I feel like we're like diving all over the <laughs> book here, because now we're gonna talk about macroaneurysms. <laughs> so um, this is uh, something to keep in mind when, you're, uh, when you see hemorrhage in every layer of the retina. There's not many things that can do that, but uh, a macroaneurysm is something that could cause hemorrhage in the vitreous, in the retina, pre-retinal, subretinal. Uh, so keep that uh, in mind when you see some unexplained hemorrhage. Often as the hemorrhage clears, you'll see this dilated uh, macroaneurysm underneath the blood. Often they can uh, sclerose on their own. As seen here, it's starting to sclerose on its own and then it will rarely re-bleed. You typically see it in elderly women and often in this temporal arcade. It's typically associated with hypertension or you might see it following a vascular occlusion. Uh, this is kind of your typical fluorescein angiogram. So you see this hemorrhage that's subretinal and some intraretinal heme. Uh, and then on your fluorescein angiogram, you get this kind of bright white bulb that lights up and that's your macroaneurysm. As far as treatments go, um, some advocate, you know, trying to close the macroaneurysm directly with laser, and that works. There is a risk though that you can get downstream occlusion of that blood vessel and cause an arterial occlusion potentially. Others advocate for kind of this ring of laser around the macroaneurysm to reduce the exudations and the macular edema. And radiation retinopathy. <laughs> so this is someone that had a plaque treatment uh, to this melanoma, and then you can see subsequently they've developed this severe radiation retinopathy with macular edema and exudates, a vein occlusion, and hemorrhages in the retina. Uh, radiation retinopathy uh, does uh, resemble diabetic retinopathy with these microangiopathic changes, and we do treat it like uh, diabetic retinopathy. It's typically uh, a delayed onset, so a year and a half or so after external beam radiation, and then with a, like a plaque brachytherapy, it'll present earlier. Treatment options, focal PRP, anti-VEGF, or steroids. You can also, um, you might need to do a vitrectomy as well for hemorrhages or tractional detachments that can occur. Um, you know, our typical exposure is 30 to 35 grays, but it has been seen in as little as 15 grays of exposure. Valsal Valsalva retinopathy is, um, can be pretty mild. In some cases, it's more severe. Often, you'll see this in somebody after they've had food poisoning and they've just been vomiting. Um, you can also see it with strenuous exercise. I've seen it with uh, 
patients with severe constipation, but um, typically this has a really good prognosis. What's thought to happen is there's a sudden rise of intrathoracic pressure and then it ruptures these small capillaries in the macula and the, and the blood is typically under the ILM, but you can also um, see vitreous hemorrhages as well. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not missing a tear in the peripheral retina or perhaps a macroaneurysm. And usually these patients are pretty healthy. You know, they come in and just under had this sudden vision loss and there's usually a reason for it. Um, and then Percher's retinopathy, this is typically seen in compression injuries. Uh, it was initially described in a man who fell from a tree and then suffered a brain trauma. And you'll see these kind of large cotton wool spots and hemorrhages as surrounding the optic nerve. It's thought to be due to the uh, injury inducing complement activation and then you get granulocyte ag aggregation and leukoembolization. It may cause permanent vision loss and is often bilateral. The vision loss usually presents one to two days after the uh, initial trauma. They can often have an afferent pupillary defect as well and optic nerve edema. It's kind of characterized by what's called uh, percher flecken. I don't know if you've heard that term. Um, but it's this kind of polygonal area of retinal whitening and there's kind of, it's hard to see here, but there's kind of a clear demarcation between that whitening and the vessel of about 50 microns. Uh, when these findings occur without trauma, we call it percher-like retinopathy and this can be caused uh, most commonly from pancreatitis, but also fat embolis embolism, amniotic fluid embolism. Uh, retrobulbar injections can cause this as well as autoimmune disease. Um, as far as treatment goes, you know, the treatments to kind of treat the underlying condition. Some people have tried high dose steroids with some varying degrees of success. And then uh, Tursen syndrome is intraocular hemorrhage associated with an intracranial uh, hemorrhage. And it's thought that there's this acute rise in the intraocular venous pressure that then ruptures the retinal vessels. So it's thought that about 30% of patients with a subarachnoid or subdural hemorrhage have intraocular hemorrhage, and this often uh, improves on its own. Um, if it doesn't improve, you know, typically we'll watch these for several months, but if it doesn't improve, you, you might need to do vitrectomy and perhaps even younger in young kids that have, have a Tursen syndrome. Typically, it's um, pre-retinal sub-ILM hemorrhages. Um, there can be sub-retinal hemorrhages as well, yeah. They're pretty close around the nerve. There is, yeah, they're pretty close around the nerve, exactly. Yeah, they're not usually kind of in the periphery. Yeah, it's posterior pole. And then it's characterized by what's called this double ring sign of hemorrhage that you can see. So the inner ring is sub-ILM blood and then the outer ring is sub-hyloid. Um, and it can occur within hours of the uh, intracranial hemorrhage. It might go unnoticed because these patients have other systemic things happening and you know potentially can't be dilated and they're not complaining of vision loss because they're you know in the ICU. But <laughs> but that's why you guys end up getting called for a lot of these, so. <laughs> All right, um, so I kind of got through that whirl, whirlwind tour of retinal vascular disease. Do you guys have questions? No, I know, it's kind of, I don't know, when I was doing the, putting the lecture together, I felt like I was all over the place, but. <laughs>